Okay, the nucleus contains the majority of an atom's mass. Protons and neutrons are much heavier than electrons. Electrons occupy almost all of the atom's volume. Um, the diameter of an atom is about one angstrom, 10 to the negative 10 meters. And the diameter of a nucleus is about 100,000 times smaller than that, which is about 10 to the negative 15 meters. So um, to give you an example of what that size difference looks like, if an atom was the size of a football field, then the nucleus would be the size of a single blueberry. So you remember us talking about Rutherford's experiment where he's firing uh, alpha particles toward gold foil. Well, the reason that most of those alpha particles could pass through untouched was because they were traveling through a football field and they were trying to hit a blueberry right in the middle of the, of the football field. So most of them went right through. And most of them missed the very, very, very small blueberry and passed through the open space of the football field. But a couple of them would actually strike the blueberry, the nucleus in the center of the atom, and they would bounce back, these alpha particles. And that's what showed that the nucleus was real. So this just gives you some idea of the fact that an, an atom is small, but even that small thing, if we said that small thing was the size of a football field, well, the nucleus is way, 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 way smaller than that. So the nucleus of an atom is incredibly small. Atoms and subatomic particles are very small. So um, we saw in the last, in section 2.2 there, that electrons have a charge of about 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And they also have very, very small masses, 10 to the negative 23 grams. So when we're talking about um, atoms, um, instead of using these units that have really s multipliers that are really small numbers, 10 to the negative 19, 10 to the negative 23rd, that makes it difficult to deal with these units. So we were talking before, if we're trying to measure the um, how much uh, a bag of oranges weighs, we probably don't want to use the, the unit of tons because a ton is 2,000 pounds and a bag of oranges doesn't weigh anywhere close to that. So a ton would not be a very good unit to measure a bag of oranges. In the same sense, grams and coulombs are not great units to, to measure atom properties because atoms are so small and these units are so big. So we introduce a new unit, the atomic mass unit. One atomic mass unit is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So now when we're talking about an atom having about that unit, that, uh, that mass, then we can say instead of it having how, how much does that atom weigh? 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams? One. It weighs one AMU. So much easier to use units that are equivalent or similar in size to the thing we're talking about. So the mass of a carbon atom is 12 AMU instead of this number up here, 2 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams. So atomic mass unit is a much easier unit to use when we're talking about the masses of atoms. Similarly, when we're talking about charge, um, when we say 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, that's a big number. We should, or rather a really small number, but a lot of digits, we should say E. E is a new unit that is the fundamental unit of charge, and it equals this number. This is, every time we have E and multiples of E, we really have multiples of this number in coulombs. So here's the mass of a proton. It's about 1 AMU, um, and it has a positive charge, plus 1. So this when we again when I say that the charge is plus one it's really plus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs because it, it has that same charge as an electron it's just positive so the mass of a neutron is also about 1 amu it's a little bit heavier than a proton um, and its charge is zero it doesn't have an electrical charge an electron its mass is much smaller than either of those about 2,000 times smaller than those so 
and its charge is equal to negative 1 E or negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, that, that elementary fundamental unit of charge. The atomic number uh, is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. So um, when we look at the periodic table and it kind of is numbered in the, and it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and the numbers go in order like this, that's a handy way of numbering things, of course, but it also refers to the atomic number. That refers to how many protons there are in that element. So um, we use a couple of different numbers to describe atoms. We need to describe the number of protons that they have. Um, we need to describe the number of neutrons that they have. And sometimes we'll put the charge on there so that we can, which is another way of telling how many electrons it has. So neutral atoms, if something is neutral, then it must have equal positive and negative charges. If um, Remember a plus and a minus charge, a proton and an electron, plus and minus equals zero. Those charges cancel each other out, and that makes something that's neutral. So if I have one proton and one electron, they cancel out and the charge is zero. If I have two protons and one electron, then they don't all cancel out. One of the protons and one of the electrons would cancel out, but one proton would be left over and I would still have a charge. So in order for an atom to be neutral, it has to have the same number of protons and electrons. Protons equals electrons. The mass number is also, um, when we're talking about elements, we need to know the mass number because it helps us figure out how many neutrons there are. So to, to put this all back into perspective of what we're talking about, we're just talking about what is an atom. An atom has a proton, a neutron, and an electron, some number of each of those. And this is how we keep track of that. The atomic number keeps track of how many protons. The mass number keeps track of how many protons and neutrons. So um, with this information, I can figure out how many neutrons there are. So the atomic number Z is the number of protons. The mass number A is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So if I want to figure out how many neutrons there are, I just take A minus Z. An ion is a particle that is charged. So uh, an ion is when the protons and the electrons on an atom are not equal. Um, maybe there's more protons than electrons, or maybe there's more electrons than protons. But if they're not equal, then the atom has an electrical charge, either positive or negative. If the charge is a positive charge, then we call that a cation. If the charge on an ion is a negative charge, then we call that an anion. So for an, uh, a negative charge to exist on an atom, that means that that atom must have more electrons than protons because electrons are negative. So if there's more negative electrons than protons, then that, charge, then that atom will have an overall negative charge. If there are more protons than electrons, and protons are positive, then that atom will have an overall positive charge, and that's called a cation. So um, a chemical symbol, and you're probably familiar with these from the periodic table, these are the one or two letter symbols that are on the periodic table that represent each element. So H is for hydrogen, C is for carbon, O is for oxygen. So H2O is, means two hydrogen and one oxygen. So chemical symbols are just those one or two letter abbreviations that, um, that stand for elements on the periodic table. So here's a drop of mercury and its chemical symbol, Hg. Hg stands for the element mercury. And it could be one atom of mercury or it can be the amount that's in this beaker here, which is trillions and trillions and trillions of atoms of mercury. So here are some elements and their chemical symbols. 
some of most of the chemical symbols have the the na the symbol is the first two letters of the element. So most of these are pretty easy. They are they match up pretty well. Cu for copper. It's not quite right because this one actually came from the Latin from cuprum. So Cu came from the Latin word for copper. And Au came from the Latin word for gold, which is aurum. Um, iron, is, its symbol is different than, it, than its English name because it came from ferrum. Lead is actually plumbum. Potassium is callium. Silver is actually argentum. Sodium is natrium. Tin is stannum. So whenever the element's name and its chemical symbol don't match, that's because the chemical symbol was derived from, um, generally from Latin names. Uh, so isotopes are these elements of atoms that were discovered around 1932, and they have their elements of, excuse me, their atoms of the same element, but they have a different mass. So, for example, magnesium exists as a mixture of three isotopes, magnesium 24, 25, and 26. So let's look at this a little bit closer. So an atom has a positive proton, and orbiting that positive proton is a negative electron. So this is an atom of hydrogen. Z equals one. Remember Z is the number of protons. I have one proton. A is the number of protons plus neutrons. Well, I have one proton and zero neutrons, so A is also one. And the chemical symbol for this atom it's H, because this is an atom of hydrogen. So the way that I put these together is to use this notation. It goes uh, A, Z, X, where X is the chemical symbol. So we said A is 1, Z is 1, and H our chemical symbol. So this would be my isotope symbol for this atom that I just drew, atom of hydrogen. But now hydrogen has different isotopes. And remember an isotope is a different kind of that atom. So I can't change the atomic number. If I change the, if I change the number of protons on this atom, then it will not be hydrogen anymore. Hydrogen can only have one proton. That's uh, the atomic number tells us what kind of element we have. And so if I change the number of protons, I've changed the element. So if I'm saying that there's different types of an element, different types of atoms within that element, then I can't change them by changing their protons. They're not different by having different numbers of protons because that would make them different elements altogether. So hydrogen always has one proton but there's three different kinds of hydrogen. So if there's three different kinds of hydrogen, three different isotopes of hydrogen, they always have one proton. And if we're talking about neutral atoms of hydrogen, and a neutral atom always has the same number of electrons as protons, so it always has one electron in this case. So if there's three different types of hydrogen and they don't differ by their number of protons or their number of electrons, then what do they differ by? The number of neutrons. So let's draw a black neutral neutron in here. Well, I don't have to fill it in, that's going to be easier for this to do. 
So this is a neutron. Remember, neutrons are, they have about the same mass as a proton, but they're neutral. And so that, that type of, that isotope of hydrogen has one neutron, and this isotope of hydrogen has two neutrons. So Z, my atomic number, is one. Here, Z is one. It has to be one because it has, it's always hydrogen. I'm talking about different types of hydrogen. In this case, A, neutrons plus protons, well, one plus one. Now A is two. For this one over here, I have two neutrons. So A equals one plus two. A equals three. So if I'm going to write the isotope symbol for these different kinds of hydrogen, then I would say A in this case is two, Z is one, and this is still H, hydrogen. Over here, um, A is three, Z is one, and this is hydrogen. So these are isotopes. They're all hydrogen. They all are hydrogen atoms because they always have one proton. Hydrogen always has one proton. But this one has one neutron in the middle, and this one over on the right has two neutrons. So these, this is what an isotope is. Isotopes. Isotopes are same number of protons, different number of neutrons. All right, now let's do another one with um, ions. So let's look at our hydrogen atoms again here. One. Let's draw my three hydrogen atoms. All right. So um, in this first one, if I don't have any um, electrons, then all I have is one proton. So plus one. I don't have any electrons. Minus zero equals plus plus here, plus one. So now let me give this guy one electron here. Let's give this one over here two electrons. So they, in this case, none of them have any neutrons. We'll just talk about the first isotope of hydrogen, the one that has zero neutrons. And let's look at what happens when I change the electrons. So here in this first one, I have plus one, no electrons, so minus zero. Here in this one, I have plus one, because I have one proton. Minus one, because I have one electron. So this equals zero. And over here, I have plus one, because I have one proton, minus two, because I have two electrons, they're negative, equals negative one. So this is the charge over here. If I have a charge of plus one, and I don't have any electrons, then the charge on this ion is plus one. And the way that I would denote this if I'm drawing isotopic notation, I my Z is still one because I have one proton. A is one because I have zero neutrons, one plus zero. So this would be one, one, H. And now if I'm gonna draw a charge, I draw the charge up here as a superscript plus. It doesn't have to be circled. Sometimes people write plus one. Sometimes people write one plus. Um, doesn't matter. Um, or if, if the charge were a two plus, then I could write two plus. So the charge, when we're denoting an ion, the charge goes up here to the right as a superscript. So let's look at the next one. Z 
is 1. A is 1, just like the last one. I didn't change neutrons or protons. So this is 1, 1, H. And this one has a charge of 0, right? We determined it has one proton and one electron, so they cancel out, and this is electrically neutral. No charge. So I don't write anything up here. Let's look at the next one. Z is still 1. A is still 1. You can change this. 1, 1, H. Now this one is negative, so I'll have a negative charge up here. Negative 1. Or maybe 1, negative. Or maybe just a negative sign without a number. All three of those are equivalent to de denoting that this has a negative charge because it has a different number of electrons and protons. So these are ions. Ions are, um, they don't necessarily have to be the same element, right? Ions are just different numbers of protons and electrons. So this is not an ion. This right here is actually an atom. Because ions are charged, and this isn't charged. It has a charge of zero. So this is not an ion. But these are ions. This is a cation, so it's positive. This is an anion, because it's negative. All right, so here again, isotopic notation. Mass number, number of protons plus neutrons. Atomic number, number of protons only. And up here, as a superscript on the right, the charge, which is the uh, protons minus the electrons. So here are the, some more properties of these isotopes of hydrogen. They also have names. This, hyd this hydrogen atom, uh, which is the most common type of hydrogen on Earth, this one's called protium. This kind of hydrogen, which has one neutron, is called deuterium. And there's about 1% of all hydrogen on Earth is deuterium. 99, excuse me, that's 0.1%. 99.9% of all hydrogen on Earth is protium. And an incredibly small amount of hydrogen on Earth is tritium which has two neutrons. So the, the only thing that's really different about these is their mass. The mass of protium is one, because it has one proton. The mass, and these are in AMU, the mass of deuterium is two, because it has one proton and one neutron, and they're about one each. The mass of uh, tritium is three, because it has uh, two neutrons and one proton. So notice how this is the mass number, it's a whole number, 3, and this is the mass, 3.01605. The mass of tritium is not a whole number. This number up here, the mass number, just tells us how many protons and neutrons there are, 1 plus 2. Because a proton weighs almost 1, and a neutron weighs almost 1, it's pretty similar. This is almost a whole number. But remember, the mass of one proton is not 1.0000, it's 1.0078. So this mass number is not a whole number. Excuse me, the atomic mass is not a whole number because of the masses of the protons and neutrons. But the mass number over here, A, in this isotopic notation, it always is a whole number, and it has to be because we're just counting things. I'm counting the number of protons and the number of neutrons. 1 plus 1, whole number, 2. 1 plus 2, whole number, 3. But when I weigh them, it's not a whole number. So again, this is just what I was kind of what I was getting after. When we're talking about the atomic mass, the reason that we only weigh the protons and the neutrons is because the electrons weigh so little compared to the protons and neutrons that we can essentially ignore them. 
Um, so when we're uh, when we're trying to calculate atomic mass, we don't have to determine how many electrons there are. It doesn't figure into the calculation of atomic mass. So um, uh, again, I would I'll, I'll just emphasize here that atomic mass and mass number are similar, but they're not the same. So um, let me let me bring up a periodic table here. Here we go. So let's look at these masses on the periodic table. This number down here is the atomic mass. This number is an average of the ice, the masses of each isotope of that element. So um, here is hydrogen. Hydrogen, the mass on the periodic table is 1.008. But when we looked at the isotope masses of hydrogen, the mass of protium and deuterium and tritium, none of them were 1.008. So this number right here is an average of the mass of all of the isotopes and multiplied by their natural abundance. So remember there were three isotopes of hydrogen, H1, H2, and H3, but 99.9% .9 of all hydrogen on Earth is H1, and 0.01% of hydrogen is H2, and an incredibly small amount is H3. So this number right here on the periodic table is an average of of all of those masses multiplied by their natural abundance. Since 99.9% .9 of hydrogen on Earth is hydrogen 1, hydrogen weighs about the same as an isotope of an atom of protium. But it weighs a little bit more than an atom of protium because we have to account for that 0.01% and the trace amount of the isotopes that are a little bit heavier. So on the periodic table, the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.008. But the mass of protium is 1.0078. So that little tiny bit of extra mass on the periodic table is accounting for these. This mass times this natural abundance, and this mass times this natural abundance, added to this mass times this natural abundance. So that's this calculation here. Here's the natural abundance of boron 10, 19.9%. That boron weighs 10.0129 AMU. Here's the natural abundance of boron 11, 80.1%. So 80% of all boron on Earth is boron 11. 20% of all boron on Earth is boron 10. They have these different masses. How do we figure out the mass that's going to be on the periodic table? Well, we multiply the natural abundance as a fraction. So 19.9% becomes 0.199. Multiply that by the atomic mass and add that to this natural abundance times this atomic mass. When we add them together, we get the, the atomic, the average mass that you will find on the periodic table. So, how do we know these things weigh this much? So, um, there were different ways of calculating the mass of elements throughout history, and one of the first ways uh, to to calculate the mass of some of the gaseous elements was to fill up balloons full of a known amount of those elements, pure elements, and then put them on balances and weigh them. And so they would weigh them relative to balloons full of other elements and figure out what their relative mass was. So now we use um, an instrument called a mass spectrometer. And this is a lot like Millikan's oil drop experiment. In fact, it's pretty much the same thing. So um, you have your sample that comes in over here, and then something, these are kind of like the x-rays. Um, they get the, Your sample gets heated up and turned into a gas, and um, electron beams are shot at it to turn it into a charged particle. Those charged particles are accelerated through these plates. These will uh, have electrical charge that will pull the ions through to make them go faster. And then there's a magnet here that will also interact with these ions as a function of their charge. And so um, the ones that are really heavy are going to fall 
and come down here on the detector. And the ones that are really light are going to go further and they're going to come over here. They'll be de deflected less. So, um, oh wait, I said that backwards. The lightest ones get deflected the most. So the magnetic field is going to deflect the light ones and they'll appear down here. And the heavy ones will get deflected the least and they'll appear up here on the detector. The point is that based on their weight, they'll get separated. And the ions that weigh different amounts will end up at different places on the detector. So that gets turned into a spectrum that looks like this. So then we can see here um, that zirconium, if I put pure zirconium in a mass spectrometer and it gets uh, vaporized and ionized and then runs through here and hits the detector, then I'll get these five peaks. This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And when I uh, look over here on this axis, this is the relative abundance. So this tells me that a little bit more than 50% of all zirconium is zirconium-90. A little bit is zirconium-91, about, what is this, 10%. Uh, about 18% is 92, 18% is 94, and then maybe 2% is zirconium-96. So there's five isotopes of zirconium having these masses and they'll be deflected by different amounts in the mass spectrometer so that we would know how much they weigh.